On today's Antiques Roadshow, we make a return visit to a venue which has been a real first for us all. A sewage pumping station. Now, Leicester City Council's Museum of Technology. Opened in 1891, the Abbey Pumping Station is a Victorian architectural gem. Not only did it achieve its aim of pumping away vast amounts of sewage from the city to a nearby treatment works, up to 20 million gallons a day, but it did it with efficiency and elegance. Most people would never have seen the inside of the engine house, but its elaborate features wouldn't be out of place in a stately home. Indeed, parts of the exterior were designed to look like a grand mansion to avoid Victorian nimbyism. Wealthy residents didn't want their views spoiled. Whoa, look at that. Like so many of Britain's heritage sites, the pumping station is maintained by a small army of dedicated volunteers cleaning, greasing, polishing is all part of the weekly routine. And as a result, beam engines are in perfect working order. And that's the brilliance of Victorian engineering for you. And this place is more than just a pumping station. It's got a hidden secret. There's also an amazing collection of vintage vehicles from the local area, which are usually crammed into this shed away from public view. But here they are. And this is my particular favourite, the hot fish and chips van. It's got its own coal-fired range and I'm reliably assured we'll be putting it to good use later. So we're getting a selection of the vehicles fired up and driven outside onto the lawn so everyone who comes to the roadshow today can appreciate them too. This is a very tranquil scene and I rather like the fisherman chatting out the two ladies as he sits on the harbour wall. I know straight away where this is painted because it's Cornwall. Yes. So it's signed on the lower left, Harold Harvey, but it hasn't got a date on it, which is quite unusual because he nearly always dated his pictures. And I think this is quite an early work by him, so dates from the very early 1900s. But the frame is also absolutely amazing. So where's it come from? It was found in my, under my grandfather's staircase. Went round to see him one afternoon and he knew we didn't have much on our walls. And he said, I have some paintings under the stairs. Would you like to go and select some? And what we liked about this one, the frame, that was about 50 years ago. Very good choice indeed. Oh, do you know where he got it from? No. Well, he must have got it by inheritance because it is so original. I mean, Harold Harvey, as an artist, has always interested me because I'm, I have a particular love of the Newton School of Painters. And there are a group of artists which really started about 1884, and Stanford Falls was it, almost in charge of the school of painters. He was the man that started it. And the interesting thing about Harold is that he was a true Cornishman. He was born in Cornwall, and he was one of the only Cornish Newling School people born in Cornwall and painted in Cornwall. He studied in Paris for a while, came back, and he studied under an artist called Norman Garston, also a member of the Newland School. But this is a classic one by him, and it's very early. Now, the frame is extraordinary, because the, when I looked at this, I think, well, there was another thing going on in Newlyn in the early 1900s, which is the Newlyn copper work. And it's very arts and crafts in design. And you look at this frame, and it's arts and crafts stick, and it sets the picture off beautifully. Now, the Newlyn School artists have been, were very popular in the 1980s, and they went up and they went down. And they're sort of back in fashion now. And I think this is a cracking one by him. And if this came up for sale, I think it would probably make somewhere in the region of eight to 12,000 pounds. Very nice. So rather nice thing to be given yes. from under the stairs. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Grandfather. Do you know, I had to smile. Uh, when this charger came out of the box, tell me what you know. I've been told that the knight on there is a French soldier by the name of Bayard. Mm -hmm. I know the artist was William Salter Mycock. Yep. The designer was um, Walter Crane. Yep. I believe it was painted or made between 1906 and 1938 
when the factory shut down and that's when my cock retired. OK. I don't know the age of it. Thank goodness. Um, I believe they were sold at Tiffany's and Co. Correct. Um, what them? I don't know. Nope. And what the value of it is now, I don't know. You don't know. Right. You're pretty well on the ball, aren't you? <laughs> this is Pilkington's Royal Lancastrian Pottery. I've described them as the Fabergé of the, the ceramic art world of the early 20th century. Uh, because uh, Lusterware wasn't really made at Pilkington's, I think, around about 1903 or thereabouts. So when you see it, it's always early 20th century. As regards to Bayard, well, the, it's interesting because you have got this text in French. What does it say? A night without fear is a night beyond reproach. My wife's French is brilliant, and she said something similar to similar. what you've just said. Yeah. Well, you've got to, you've got to yes, remember, yes. I've said all the right words, but not necessarily, necessarily in the right, right order. Yeah. OK. Yes. Yes. Um, but yeah. when I'm looking at, a, at an object like this, um, I'm mindful that this was actually made in various colour versions. Yes, I do know. And that. there is a, an orange or flame luster that is seen as the ultimate. But hey, listen, this is just sheer magic. The design, as we can see, all around the edge in gold, we've got sinuous dragons. This is often referred to amongst Pilkington collectors as St. George and the Dragon. Now, right. hey-ho, the jury's going to be out on this one, and I thought I'm, I'm still on a learning curve. Somebody else said it was um, Sir Lancelot. So... <laughs> Well, um, yeah, we, I mean, we could bring know. them all into this, couldn't you could, we? You could, uh, yeah. We really could. Certainly not me. No, yeah. but we all want to be a knight in shining armour, don't yes, we? Yes. We really do. I've had a look at the mark on the back. There's a year symbol, yes. and I know that this was actually made in 1933. 1933. Wow. Okay. You didn't know that. Did I you? didn't know that. Thank no. Goodness no. for that, because you knew everything else. <laughs> but have you? I tried. The, I tried. Um, but now to fill in the missing gap when it comes to valuation. I mean, I'd like to say that it's worth at least £5,000, but, but it isn't. It's actually worth £12,000. Right. <laughs> Could you do that again for the benefit <laughs> of... Thank you, thank you, thank you. 12000 Wow. My wife will be very pleased. <laughs> You know, I've seen plenty of tapestries, needlework, cruel work over the years, but this one's a bit of a mystery. What have you managed to find out about it? Uh, not a great deal. We've had it 50 years. My husband got a job in East Africa and we went to live in Kenya. We were furniture provided. So um, one day we were out, saw this in a, an auction house and thought that that would be really nice in our house to make it a bit more individual. And we've lived with it in different countries, different houses ever since. And when you think of tapestries and needleworks of this type, you immediately think of the likes of William Morris, Burne Jones, Kelmscott Manor, mm, and even yeah. if you go back far enough, you think of Blenheim Palace with the huge tapestries from the early 18th century. Mm. But this one, you've got some crafts in here, you've got Art Nouveau, you've got Greek, but for me, all of that is really encompassed just by the symbolism and the central figures of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with this Greek text up here. Please say you managed to work out what the Greek is. Well, a friend of mine came to dinner one night and he said that it says, the earth shall exist and the earth shall pass away, but the love of God endureth forever. And I think the, the word here, agape, is the mm. love of God. So I think he was correct. And you're quite right, I know this word, uh, agape is basically translated, it means the unconditional love of God, which, you know, he had for Adam and Eve. Country of origin, have you thought of that? No. In this sort of area? Uh, probably the nude figures. The of course, nude at figure. one time I wondered if it would be made for a church, an altar cloth or something. Definitely but not. not no. with those figures. Not with bits in there. No, uh, that quite, doesn't quite uh... graphically. <laughs> uh, but you see, in this country we were quite fussy about that sort of thing. You'd have that covered up in, in a modest way. So that leads me to think actually the whole style of it, I'm leaning towards France or continental Europe. But I, I would say, you know, with a bit more research, France, mm. possibly Belgium, but it, it's definitely not English, in my view, purely because of that. And the condition 
is an issue. You've lost, I think, at least sort of 50% of its colour. You can see traces here of how unbelievable it would have shone. Mm. And then the damage, you know, with this type of work, these plain areas are what take all the stress mm. and, and they will go. So there is an awful lot of restoration. Yeah. You won't do anything with a colour, but you could certainly stabilise mm. it. Do you remember what you paid for it? £50, I think. Which was... Which in was, 1967. Ah, which was a reasonable amount. So I think today, taking into consideration the condition issues, easily sort of two to three thousand pounds. Okay. Okay. ...and radical in its time. And these are seriously radical for their time. They're sculpture from, I think, the late 60s, maybe early 70s. They're fantastic. What's your interest in this? I've acquired them from my cousin. I inherited them. She oh, really? died in 2006. But I believe she bought them in 1967 wow. from a local artist, George Picard. But she had them in her flat in London, which was a bit of a 60s time warp. Um, and they took pride of place there. And since we've inherited them, they take pride of place with us now. We, we just love them. Well, she was very stylish and very with it for her time. Because for me, it's all about that um, 40, 50 years gap. Because in the 70s, late 70s, yes. uh, people were collecting and looking at art from the 20s, 30s and 40s. That was a 40 year, 50 year gap. And it's the same here, because this is what is really popular now. George Picard, as you said, was a local artist. I mean, you must know something about him. He went to the Leicester School of Architecture and then he studied in the Royal Artillery as a camouflage artist. Oh, gosh, no, I didn't yeah, know yeah. that. Yes. He was a regimental artist studying right. camouflage. And then he practised architecture for a while. And then at Leicester Polytechnic. Right. And he was interested in sculpture with architecture. And both of these have architectural elements about it. It almost looks like a brick wall, but it's so pure. It's so beautiful, these plates. It's like a sort of modern bass relief and it, it looks like it's been oxidized or anodized he was very interested in textures and he worked with all sorts of materials and these to me were the sort of things i was trying to sell in the early 80s right and people it was just too soon <laughs> and do you have these hanging at home we do indeed this lives in our breakfast room which we use every day and just we Fantastic. just love it you know beautiful Fantastic. both of them beautiful pieces yes i see that one down there is signed yes. picard 1967 and this is actually preempting the 70s and 80s they haven't really advanced much more than this <laughs> in this sort of thing I mean, again, I don't know, is this one signed and dated? I don't believe it is, no. no. But it's so pure again. And again, it's like construction. He did brutalist stuff as well, really sort of almost like small steel girders. Yes, and, yes. And people haven't recognised him yet. I think he's somewhat of a genius, to be quite honest. I mean, this is so sublime. It's so clever. But his stuff isn't really making a huge amount. Mm, mm. I mean, I think today, in this climate, a piece like this would make... A thousand to fifteen hundred. Gosh, right. And I yes. think a piece like this would be at least two thousand right. pounds, maybe two and a half. Mm. Okay, that's nice to know. Thank you very much. So, what a wonderful Heath Robinson type of machine. Yes. Uh, it's purpose is, I understand, to core and peel an apple. That's right, yes. yes. Is that why you bought it? Well, I, I just bought it because I, I, I like the mechanical part, you know. I actually, I've never tried it, to be honest. And how long have you had it? Oh, about 20 odd years. 20 years? Yeah. yeah. So we stick the apple there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Carefully. Yeah. And then, um, Turn that slowly. That's it. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember how much you paid for it? Fifteen pounds. I think it's wonderful. Yes. I, I think if you sold it today, yeah. I could sixty pounds. You really? Yeah. Oh word. <laughs> Whether you know something about jewellery or you know nothing about jewellery, 
That surely is an exquisite piece of jewellery. Mm. And for me, it represents everything that I most admire and love about a piece of antique jewellery. Style, design, originality, stones, everything. So from that you can gather, I quite like it. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about it. What do you know? It was my mother-in-law's mm -hmm. and she got it off her mother and now it belongs to my sister-in-law, but she couldn't come today, so I'm here instead. So you are the bringer of? Yes. Doesn't belong to you? No, no, no. So what do you think about it then? Is this the first time that you've seen it or is this something that you know, this piece? No, I know it quite well because my mother-in-law actually wore it to our wedding. And do you think it wearing a piece like that, do people admire it? Because it does draw the eye, doesn't it? It does. I think some people don't like insects and things, but I do. Do you? Yeah, yes. I do. Good. So I think it's beautiful. Well, you touch upon a very important point, because at the end of the Victorian period when this was made, circa around 1900, insect jewellery was extremely popular. People liked th um, things like butterflies, bumblebees, dragonflies, and all sorts of creepy crawlies as well that you wouldn't like very much, such as spiders. No. You know, a gem set spider? No. Hmm. <laughs> but a dragonfly, I think, is something that we can all identify with. We like it. It draws the eye. So, what is it made of? It's made of gold. Okay. The body is a slightly graduated curving line of diamonds and Burmese rubies. Oh, right. Not modern diamonds, the old diamonds. So typically stones that would have been cut and fashioned in around about 1895, 1900. And they twinkle a little bit more softly than a modern diamond will do. Yes. The rubies, Burmese, as I say, they have this very characteristic pinkish red colour. So these are not stones that you'd see in a modern mine, they're the old mine goods. And nice. again, that's highly sought. The central ruby is faceted, can you see that? Yes. All the rest of the rubies in the body are faceted, but did you notice the nice little touch that the ones in each of these eyes are cabochon cut? No, I don't So, well, look, see that? They're domed. Oh, yes. Do you see that? Yes, they're much rounded and smooth, yes. Now we move on to the really interesting part of this because it's the wings. They look real. Well, what are they? Well, they're individual natural pearls. But how long would it have taken to find four pearls mm. that matched in such perfect symmetry? Mm -hmm. And I could see such a piece coming up at an auction and attracting all sorts of interest from dealers, mm -hmm. from private people, from collectors who like insects and all this sort of thing. So, ticks yes. the boxes. Is there a maker's mark on it? No, uh, I wouldn't necessarily expect to see one. There weren't any particular people who were making these sort of things. I think they had a universal appeal, so they were sold by first-class jewellers in London and in major towns and cities. Right, OK. So now what's it worth? I think it's going to attract a lot of interest. And because of that, I think I'm going to be quite punchy on my estimate. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but I know if it comes up for auction, I think someone's going to pay four to five thousand pounds for wow. it. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so there we are. I just think it's an absolute lush delight. Good. I'm glad you like it. I do. <laughs> Very good. I'm delighted to be able to welcome Jo Orton's sister um, to talk to. Um, jo Orton was quite a controversial and rebellious literary figure in many ways. Homosexual in the sort of 50s, 60s when Ooh. it was criminalised indeed. Yes. Yes. Um, and yet he became a hugely important figure in the theatrical world. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. This is the 50th anniversary of his... Of his death, yeah. His death, OK. And what was he like um, growing up with as a, as a, as a young boy? That's... He was a pleasure, you know. He was lovely to be around and he was kind and considerate and, you know, he used to put plays on in the back garden and stuff like that. I think because he was very often ill with asthma that he didn't... Um, participate in, in normal boyish things, you know, climbing trees, swimming in the canal and stuff like that. So, yeah, he, he, he did read a lot. Right. And then he joined the Amateur Dramatic Society, several of them, in Leicester. One of the things here yeah. is a first edition of... Entertaining Ent Mr Sloan. Which is perhaps his best-known work. Yeah, his first full-length, yeah. 
and it's inscribed yes. by uh, Joe jo, yeah. to your parents. Yes. But what struck me is that it's just so unaffectionate in many it ways. It is, yeah. I agree with you. It's just to mum and dad from Joe. Yeah. No love. Yeah, and, and I just think it says volumes about how parents. Do you think that sort of affected his, his writing then later on? Oh, absolutely. On? Everyone says how detached Joe was. I mean, take Luke, for example. I mean, there's a coffin on stage, you know, the contents is this woman who is sort of shoved around, took out the coffin, pushed into a wardrobe, she's standing on her head, and the whole place is sort of mocking everything that we hold dear. Really. Yes. Once he'd sort of left home, did you see him on a regular basis? Yeah. Fairly regularly, yeah. I mean, we, I used to go to Astor or the plays with him okay. and Kenneth Halliwell. You mentioned Kenneth Halliwell, yes. who was Joe's lover, partner, partner yeah. because, of course, it was Kenneth Halliwell who ended up killing, him, killing yeah. Joe. Yes. It was a brutal <coughs> murder, it wasn't was it? It was a very brutal murder, yes. yes. He was a very attacked with, with a, a hammer. With a hammer. Yes. And then what happened to... Um, Halliwell after that? He committed suicide, he took 22 sleeping tablets and was dead before Joe. Oh my word, okay. The family never knew that Joe was homosexual. Okay. Until after his death. So uh, this typewriter is presumably the one that Joe he, he used? He wrote, this is the, the later typewriter. Right. That he mentions on it, um, or what the bottle saw on it. Okay. Important piece of Important literary history. Important piece of Orton archive, I think. Quite. And you corresponded as well, presumably. Oh, yes. Letter. They're all at the Leicester University. Apart from this one here. Oh, that one, that's, that recently came into my possession from my niece, who was going through some stuff that she was throwing out and found this, and she sent it me, which I'm really pleased she did. It's a very brief sort of note, really. Dear to Doug. My, to our brother, to yes, your Douglas. Brother. I've been asked to appear on the Eamon Andrews show this Sunday. Why not watch? Question mark J. I mean, it's very brief. It's lovely, but, isn't know, it? Yeah. yeah. You know, a fascinating personal insight. You can't get much closer than a famous playwright's sister. I'm sure that they won't come onto the market, but if they did, for example, a copy of a first edition of Entertaining Mr. Sloan, you don't have the dust jacket, no. which nowadays makes a big difference. Yeah. But you have. You know, the inscription, the inscription yeah. makes yeah. it. It turns it from a £50 book without a dust jacket into suddenly a £500 book right. with the inscription. Right. Something like the typewriter, I can see that making three, £4,000 at auction, something really? like that, just, just because... Just because of the association, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you're looking at several thousand pounds mm. worth of pieces. What, what you know and can tell us and have told us about Joe yeah. Orton um, that, that, that made it, really. What an absolute visual feast you brought for me today. Obviously, they are dolls in various costumes or countries of Europe. What can you tell me about them? They were basically made by my cousin in, in the 50s, between 1952 and 1958, purely as a hobby. So she wasn't a seamstress or Not at a all. designer by profession? No. What did she actually do? She was a school secretary. Gosh, what is absolutely incredibly striking about them is that how absolutely accurate they are. And what I really love about them is that they've got absolutely every detail perfectly. They've even got all their underclothes. Yes. And she's even got little knitted stockings. And having been forced to wear a Welsh costume like this in school when I was younger, I can tell you this is absolutely accurate. But I have to say, all the European ones, they're so colourful and so yes. beautiful. But this one here, which presumably is the English one, she's really rather drab by comparison, yes. isn't she? Unfortunately, yes. But what I do like about it is the fact she's got a little rolled-up magazine there, the Reader's Digest, in her very sensible handbag. Do this. Was she interested in sewing particularly? She uh, basically self-taught. She learned to, uh, with an interest from her grandma and just went on from there. And um, why, what induced her to do this, I don't know. She was always very interested in everything around her. Actually, what sort of strikes me as well is that they were made over quite a short period. Yes. Uh, just the six years. Six years, so you wonder what did she do afterwards? Did she sort of move on to other things? Oh, she made many, many wedding dresses. Right. And she wrote and produced 
and did knit all the costumes for 50 pantomimes. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, right, OK. So she was obviously quite well known Always locally. busy. Well, they're a slightly, almost a difficult thing to price, really. You know, they are, they're so fabulous and they're so accurate. They've got to be worth individually maybe £150 to doll collectors. So, you know, the collection as a whole, yeah. you're probably looking at three, three to £4,000 okay. quite easily on them, I would think. Yes, but the, for the work that went into them, I guess that's not a very big return. <laughs> that's often the way with the, yeah. you can never really quantify the amount no. of hours that goes into, no, no. into work. But no. you know, they are fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's World War. The Royal Flying Corps flew over the trenches, but were always handicapped by the fact, uh, and in certain circumstances blessed them, that they didn't have a parachute. And that always strikes most people as something which is a terrible thing to do. But what we have to understand about that is that their parachutes didn't work the way that they work today. They had to be fixed to something static. Where did you get this album from? I was clearing my parents' house in 2012 and found it in the loft. So what sort of link has your family got well, with? Well, my father, who was born way after this, he was born in 26, um, he was in aviation, he was um, involved in airworthiness and for a while he worked for a company called Hanley Page and he did investigating black boxes and looking into okay. that sort of thing. So he's come across this book, mm. which is about actually the development of the parachute. Yeah. And it has some fantastic photographs in it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Look at this. They're actually jumping off of Tower Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> but what this book seems to be is a set of photographs as they test various parachutes. Mm. <laughs> because look at this. Miss Boyden. I know. Who is she? <laughs> Who is she? Inverted. Yeah. Even better. Bless her. She occurs quite a lot, actually, in mm, the book, doesn't mm, she? She does. Yeah. Did your father ever talk about the book? Not at all. I didn't know of its existence. Really? Literally found it in the loft. He kept it squirrelled away, highly protected. Yeah. Odd. <laughs> Most of the photographs are 1919, mm. so just as the First yeah. World War finished. Yeah. And they're still using the static line. Yeah. Because it's not until the very early 1920s that a man called Irving, an American, mm. he invents the parachute that has a ripcord. Yeah. And suddenly aviation changes forever. Yeah. Because now you can equip a man or a woman yeah. with a parachute to bail out, to bail out yeah. of, a, of a desperate situation yeah. where the actual parachute doesn't have to be attached. Mm. That's the problem, because yeah. if your aircraft yeah. is going down and you're attached to it, you go with it. Yeah. It doesn't work. But this album is at the very, very beginnings of that sort of parachute technology, mm. which in the 20s and 30s and then the 40s would save so many lives of men of the Royal Air Force. It's an absolutely fascinating book. So as with all unique things, it's a really difficult thing to value. But I think if you saw that in a, in a dealer shop, it's £100. Wow. Wow. Um, and even maybe a bit more. Gosh. Thank you. Well, this is not someone I expected to meet today at the Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> Ken Loach, world-famous film director, films well, like well. Kathy Come Home, Cares, of course, Win the Shakes of Barley, and I, Daniel Blake, which is your, your latest film. Are you a fan of the roadshow? Um, yes, I, I, I watch most weeks if I'm at home. Um, and I, I, I enjoy seeing the craft of old pieces. And, um, I like the furniture, I like the wood, I like, I like humble pieces that, are, um, that have a history and, and where you can see their age, you can see the, see the use that they've had. And you've brought something along today, have you? Well, I have. I mean, it's the humblest um, little piece. Have you, have you got um, it on you? I have. Well, I've got it on this chair. It's just a pewter candle holder, and uh, we've had it years, and I know it's of no great value, but I'm just interested in how old it is. And are but you a collector, Ken? Not really, no. I, I like bits of pewter. I like it because it's utilitarian, um, and it's, it's, there's something very proletarian about it as a piece. Which would appeal to you? Well, yes. Well, as you know, we are silver and metalwork specialists, and they can tell you all about it. What a fantastic-looking table. What can you tell me about it? 
Well, it came into our possession about six years ago. I saw it on a, an auction site online catalogue and we decided to put a bid in for it and fortunately we were very lucky in obtaining it. So you bought it unseen from um, the online catalogue? Unseen, yes. I don't like doing it, but uh, the time is so short that we really had to put a bid in and, and get it. This is called, you probably know, Pietro Dure. Yes. Hardstone. Yes. All of these different parts are all made from different stones, different marbles. In this case, lapis, um, mm. possibly even lapis lazuli, with little bits mm. of silver in it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, semi-precious stone. Well, firstly, we know this is clearly Masonic. I don't know what these symbols mean. Is there a meaning you can explain to me about them? Yes. The centrepiece, really, is showing the entrance to King Solomon's Temple right. and the two pillars on either side, well known to masonry, and you can look in the Old right. Testament. Right. So we assume it was made for a Masonic lodge, we in, assume. We do, mm -hmm. yes. But, but what research have you done for it? What, have you, what do you know about it? <laughs> right. As it was a local here, but mm -hmm. uh, an mm -hmm. expert assured me that it was not from Derbyshire. He's right, definitely not. Yeah. Right. And so then we thought about Italy, and we've got a colleague who lives in Italy, and she went to the leading officio there to... The officio del Pietro Giure. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had a look at the photographs, and they said it's not typical Italian work. So we then cast our net a little bit further adrift, and um, we finished up Malta. And we found that some Italian workmen had gone to Malta in the 18th century mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to do some work for the Knights of Malta there. Right. Gosh, it's difficult to tell the origin because there's another country I can throw in, another continent, mm. which is India. Right. So it's got a great mm. base. I mean, what's it from a catalogue? What date did they say it was in the catalogue? Well, they said the base was mid-19th century. Right. People seem to think that the, the top is from the earlier part of the 19th century. Right. And I gather during the Grand Tour, people would go and buy a top or another piece, and then when they came home, would have a base made. Right, that makes total sense. And, and the, but again, getting back to India, mm -hmm. the base of that swollen baluster base with yeah. the bedrooning is more colonial, more Indian to me than anything else. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is the date. Yeah. What date is it really? Mm -hmm. Well, I've had a good look at it. It's not old, comparatively modern, I'm afraid. Mm, right, okay. It's a modern look underneath. Right. And the base, um, as well, to my astonishment, is a relatively modern base. Really? If this was an old one, mm -hmm. early 19th century, it'd be worth 30 or 40,000 pounds. Yeah. Please tell me you didn't pay 30 or 40,000 no. pounds for it. You paid just over 1,000 pounds. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Yeah. That's all right. That's yeah. all right. It's got to be worth seven or 8,000 pounds, surely. Mm. Mm. We'd be very happy with that. <laughs> I've just been having a very pleasant chat to Fiona and brought this humblest of pieces uh, and she said I should bring it to you. Um, it's just a little pewter candle holder oh, right. and it's a very little value I'm sure but I was just interested to know how old it was, whether it's simply a 19th century or whether it's older than, than that. We, well, we've had it ages. I was going to say where did you get it from? Um, we bought it from an antique shop, but I can't remember buying it. We've, it's like we've always had it, so it must be 30 or 40 years Just ago. one of these things you picked up and, yes, yeah, and yeah. you kept it. Well, I think it's probably mid-19th century, 1850s, right. 1860s. Right. Pewter, probably English-made, actually. There's no indication as to a maker's mark, right. so we're never going to know. It's some century. I'm, I'm just going on instinct. You know, I look at a lot of silver pieces mm. and you just kind of go stylistically, really. When there's no marks on it, it's difficult to say for sure. Right. But if I had to stick my neck out, I would say circa 1850, something right. like that. Right. Well, it keeps our keys on the whole table. I was so going to say, does it ever have candles in it? Uh, it does have candles oh, in it. Oh, good. Yeah, well, it From should From time do. to time. Yes, it does. Price-wise, it's not going to be worth a fortune, I'm afraid. No. <laughs> I, I, it's, um, in a way, it's, it's, it's the... It's the tactile nature of the, the metal is often like yeah. and, and the use it's had over the years. I think if you were looking for a similar one, you'd have to spend maybe 30 to 50 pounds. Good. That's, right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's about our range. Well, so nice of you to come along and thanks very much indeed. What a gruesome mug. <laughs> it's horrible as the execution of Louis the 16th in 1793, with blood and gore and everything. <laughs> How did you come by this? Well, it came into our family in 1936 
her family's actually German or part German, and a British aristocrat who was living in Germany at the time gave it to my mother's sister. And you'll note there's some damage on there or when the RAF bombed Hamburg and it fell off a shelf, basically, <laughs> and that caused the damage. I see. And uh, I took possession of it in 2014. Good Lord, how extraordinary. But what a gruesome subject. Yeah. How do you, do you like it? Well, I found it very interesting, I have to say. But what I was wondering was whether it was a souvenir at the time or is that not the correct time period for that to be made? View of the guillotine on the modern beheading machine at Paris, by which Louis XVI, late King of France, was beheaded January 21st, 1793. And there's his head. <laughs> 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 terrible. Absolutely shocking. But it is, it is genuine at the time. Oh, really? It's an extraordinary subject, because it wasn't made in France. This was made in England. Really? <laughs> of course, the France hated it, and so they, they never depicted it. And it's difficult always to know where it was made, but it's probably Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire, but made in 1793, and I think it's absolute fun, really. <laughs> if it had been perfect, it would be worth, I suppose, damaged as it is. Still interesting, 200 to 300 pounds. And it's great to know it's history. I'd better get the RF to pay me the other 800 then. <laughs> <laughs> so a date that I will always remember from school is 20th of July, 1969. Do you know what happened then? Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Exactly that. And out of the spacecraft came Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, who were both wearing Omega wristwatches. Now, at about the time that the Japanese were making great inroads with quartz crystal in the 1970s, Omega introduced this, which is the Flightmaster. And is this one of the main pieces of your collection? No, I have a, a number of old watches, antique watches. A number? How yeah. many? Probably about a hundred. A hundred? <laughs> yeah. OK. <laughs> OK. And where do you get them from? From, from dealers or...? No, no, mostly from car boots, charity shops, over the last 30 years or so. So don't tell me this was a car boot yes. buy. Yes, it was. About 15 years ago. Yeah. Well, in the car boot. I wasn't sure whether it was an original or a or either, and that's why it was reflected in the price, and I think I paid no more than £5 for it. Too much. <laughs> Too much? Yes. Do I gather that you don't like these things? No. Taking up room in my house, I want to check them all out. <laughs> You're all joking, of, no, surely. No, all of it. <clears throat> lots, lots of car boot items that he picks up, and he always says, this is this is a treasure, do you know this? And I have to watch the Antiques Road Show with him. Well, that's Long very good. Long suffering <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, you tolerate this, and I tell you, it's just as well, because tolerate. for a fiver, he's done OK. Well, let's just say it's a two-button chronograph, so... You've got this rather nice high vis, as they call it now, but uh, orange, centre seconds hand, three o'clock position, you've got a 30 minute recorder, and at the bottom you've got a 12 hour recorder. The running seconds is in the nine o'clock position. So you stop, start, and zero with those two, and then here, this button on the other side of the watch is to set a different time zone. The Flightmaster was Omega's first specific pilot's watch. And I can tell you right now that it is the real thing. Oh, good. No. Not bad no. buy, then? Useful buy. <laughs> <laughs> Very useful buy. Let's just say around 1973-74 was when this thing was introduced. This is an... And chronographs have gone very, very balmy over the last two to three years. At auction, you're probably going to have to pay, including a buyer's premium, a very least £2,500. So I'm going to come with you to that next boot fair. Yeah. <laughs> but next roadshow, what I'd like you to do is bring the other hundred watches yeah. and we can okay. give you equally good surprises. Thank, Thank you, you both. Thank you. So where did you get it? Well, I got it from my cousin, Sally, who posted it to me. And she dug it up in the garden of an aunt of mine about 40 years ago. 
um, and she did a bit of research and she did think it was French. Well, it's not French. She must have mm. thought it was French because it's got this French writing on the bottom, which I think translates mm. as, I make you laugh. Uh -huh. Of course, it's a figure of Harlequin. Right. And it's a little toy or a seal made at the Chelsea factory oh, in right. round about 1770. Good Lord, that's amazing. It's very small. Yeah. And it's worth about 300 pounds. Ooh, brilliant. <laughs> She'll be delighted. Oh, let her know what can I'm on. <laughs> Well, I hear there's something fishy going on today. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm so thrilled you brought it in. How did it come into your life? Well, it actually belongs to my parents-in-law. They actually inherited it from my husband's grandmother. It just sits in the living room and my daughter particularly loves to play with it. Oh, does she? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's something we'd better be slightly careful with <laughs> because, as you probably well know, let's have a look. Not only is it a fish model, but look. Yeah, <laughs> it's very tactile. It's very tactile indeed, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Now, it's made from silver. Okay. The one thing that struck me as well is not just how well it's articulated, but it's the size. Okay. These come in from two inches right up to this size here. And the form is based on a Middle Eastern spice box. Okay. So the idea would be that the head would hinge open and spices were kept inside it. Now, your one is slightly different. It's just actually a model of a fish. Okay. But each individual scale section is articulated and held together with these intricate pins. Beautifully disguised, hence this wonderful, realistic fish movement. The eyes on the fish are made from green agate underneath the fins. I don't know if you noticed, there's two marks yeah, there. Yeah, my father-in-law said that he thinks it might be 1938, possibly. Not sure, though. <laughs> well, that's a good guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not like English silver that we can yeah. date exactly. Okay. This is Spanish silver. Yes. So I would have said circa 1940, 1950 even is, okay. ab is about right. Yeah. It does look a bit older, and that's simply because it's not been cleaned recently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't worry about that too much. I don't know what you think, but I think it's a carp, probably. Yeah, it does look like a carp. It does, doesn't like, it? Yeah. yeah. And the carp is quite an auspicious fish for the Chinese. Mm. Fertility produces a lot of family. The condition is wonderful. I would say quite comfortably, if this turned up in a sale, I know it's not going to because you like yeah, it. Yeah, we love it. It's hopefully <laughs> going to be passed down the yeah. generations. I would comfortably think a valuation of around about £1,000. Oh, wow. That's a nice amount. <laughs> it's a nice amount. Yeah, surprising. Uh, but thanks so much for bringing it along. Oh, it's a wonderful awesome. piece. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So here we are, surrounded by love. Where did these wonderful Victorian Valentines come from? Well, my father, he owned a toy shop and a stationery shop. And one day in the early 60s, when I was a teenager, and came across all these old stock, so they've not actually been used. Which is rather poignant, actually. All these tokens of love never went yes. to anyone. No, no, they didn't. But of course, it was in a period where people did send valentines they either delivered them themselves and it was very romantic and these are some wonderful examples i mean they also had sort of quite sort of funny cards too a bit of a sense of humor the victorians yes. so not only just the sentimentality but it's a wonderful period and these really are an incredible range of cards they're, they're very elaborate with all this jewelry and flowers and a pearl. And I think, you know, to show your, your state of love, you wanted to get something really beautiful oh, yes, yes. to send to your loved one. So these would be handmade in a factory, all these layers put on top. I mean, there's a lot of intricate work in these cards. But there's some very beautiful ones, some very elaborate ones. And of course, this is the high point of Victorian society, sort of 1880, 1890, up to 1900. This is the sort of dates we have for these cards. We've got marry in haste and repent at leisure. I mean, say you were just about to get married, you don't really want to get a card like this, no, do you? No, certainly don't. It's an interesting point that Victorian sentimentality, people don't like it, they don't like, you know, the whole over-emotional yes. side. But interestingly, Valentines have kept their appeal. And I counted about 80 of these type of Valentines in your collection. 
And actually, I would place a value of about 2,500 right. on yes. the Valentines. Yes, that's interesting. Do you know, if I had to choose one object that I've seen all day, this would be it. Really? You must absolutely love it. I do. <clears throat> what do you know about it? I found it in a shop I used to visit when I was buying sandwiches in Leicester, just mm. off the London Road there, and I watched it for about 18 months, two years, and one day it was empty, and the ladies were selling it, so I think I paid about £50 pounds for it. 50. Like and when was this? 1977, I think. Wow. I think it's just visually this is to me when companies really started nowadays they'll get a famous actor or whatever to sell their biscuits or their projects this was all about making something which just showed the quality of their mm. products mm. and this is just as good as it gets you know how it all works it was made to take four tins at the top four tin the biscuit tin out place it on the top yeah Take your, yes. your loose little bag of, of biscuits home from that tin. Tin would go back in. It's just a brilliant <clears throat> piece of display. And they're so hot now. These sort of things. Everyone wants this type of thing. This lovely glass panel here. Royal Warrant. Marble top. Mm. Oak case. Mm. I just love it. Absolutely love it. Explain the handbags. Yes. Um... <laughs> My wife commandeered it maybe, what, three years ago, four years ago? I think that when you bought it, it was out of fashion. Yes. Now, very in fashion. This is, is as good as you get for, for people wanting display pieces. Easily at auction, seven to nine hundred pounds. Yeah, that's, that's good. It's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Serene and stylish are two words that I think sum up this rather lovely 1960s Hornsey pottery lamp base. But you must have been a very young girl when I this was, was yes, made. I was, yeah. Did you buy it? No, my mum and dad bought it. We were going on holiday up to Yorkshire, to Ray, and she liked it so much that I bought it. It's quite a large piece and it had quite a lot of sort of links to fashions in ceramics of the period. So was it expensive, do you remember? I don't remember how much it would be. Do you like it? Not really. No? <laughs> it's, it's OK. <laughs> so if you don't like it, where does it live at home? I have a nasty feeling about this. <laughs> it lives in a div divan bed in the drawer, in the pull-up drawer. It lives under a bed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's not lighting up your life in no. a living room or something? <laughs> no. Dear, oh dear. So it was designed in 1965 and produced at the Hornsey Pottery and designed by their leading designer at the time, who was John Clapperson, who also modelled it with Alan Luckham. And it was in request to the company chairman, Desmond Rawson, who said he wanted a sort of a sculptural figural centrepiece. And I think it does that rather majestically. It was produced in two parts um, and it could be a vase or, as here, a lamp base. And it was quite complex to make. And I mentioned before that it looked at sort of ceramic fashions of the day. So what they were looking towards was Scandinavian design and the work particularly of two designers, Bjorn Wienbled, who was a Danish designer, and also Stig Lindberg, who was a Swedish designer. So it rolls in a lot of sort of what was happening at the time and it's executed in this sort of wonderful white glass. Not the museum. Right. And they said it was one of six. Well, Obviously, they're the museum, they know what they're talking about, um, and that's absolutely the case. It was extremely hard to make at the time, and it just wasn't cost-effective. So only a very, very few were made. And collectors love Hornsey pottery. However, there is one slight problem with it, which you probably know about. Yes, yeah. Somewhere between the museum and the, underneath the bed, it's got a big chip yeah. on the back. That's not good news. No. Collectors like things to be in perfect shape. But... You have one thing that the museum doesn't have. That's right. <laughs> you have the lampshade, don't you? I do, yes. <laughs> and there are period photographs that show the lampshade as well as the lamp base, so we know this is absolutely the correct one. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a lamp base that sums up the styles of the day in terms of ceramic design. It's by a company whose, whose works are collected and very much of the time. But we've got a chip in the back. That's a negative. But you've got the lampshade. That's a positive. So I'm going to say a thousand pounds. Gosh. <laughs> oh, 
didn't expect that. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a rare, rare thing. Well, these saucer-shaped containers are rather mysterious looking. Oh. Well, yes. When I was uh, clearing my grandfather's house after he passed away, I found a couple of these box things in a drawer. Uh, I had no idea what they were, so I, I started to do a little bit of research. I know he was born in uh, New Zealand. I know he travelled around the southern Indian continent, uh, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, around there. So I started sort of looking in that direction, and I did discover exactly, basically, what they are. Beetle lime boxes. Correct. Absolutely. So throughout South Asia and um, Southeast Asia, there's a culture of having areca nut, what we also call betel nut, which would be very often sliced up, fermented, mixed up with different spices and consumed often in a betel leaf. But the main mixture with all of this was a lime paste and it was an edible lime. And of course, these containers were used for the lime. And you can even see if you open them up that um, you can still see the traces yeah. of the lime, can't you? Yes. You can see how used these would have been. And this one is rather handy because it comes with its own little spoon. spatula, little spoon. Well, do you know why the lime was so important and why these containers were made? Because, as you can see, they're designed to be portable. Yes. There is a story that um, to get rid of your enemies in love or poison uh, the person, and they generally done it with the lime. So, in the end, people thought that well, it would be better to carry my own personal supply of lime with me. Having betel nut and having a little package of betel nut in the leaf was a form of uh, hospitality and engagement, and it was done all the time. It was like having a cup of tea. But the lime could be infected quite easily. Mm. It could be mixed up, as you say, with all kinds of different ingredients quite easily, narcotics, etc habit, but the design is coming from the West. I think for me the most fascinating one is this one, because what you have here is the actual box for the betel nut, and then you have the beautiful little container here for the lime. Yeah. And so this is the type of thing in the 19th century or the early 20th century, a gentleman from Ceylon or Southeast Asia would travel around with and have with him as an accessory, showing I'm rather fascinated by how you acquired so many of these. Has it become something of a Obsession? Obsession? <laughs> yes, it has, really. Once I, I found out uh, what they were and where they came from, it, it just it interested me. They're not known about in the West. It's something that people are, have no idea about. And so I, I started doing more research and started collecting. You found them in the oddest places. And it, it's just gradually, over the years, built into what surprised me is a quite large collection. But the fact that people don't recognise them means that you can swoop in and pick them up for nothing. Exactly, yes. You might pay, say, £30 for the Chatelain type. This one, actually, I got from France. And they didn't know what it was, sold it as a large snuff box or trinket box. a lot box. of snuff. And, <laughs> <laughs> and about €50 Euros for that. Uh, I haven't seen all of them. I know you still have some yes. hidden at home that yes, you haven't shared, yeah. you haven't brought with us. But I would have thought in the area for the whole group, for the right buyer, of something like fifteen to £20,000. Goodness. <laughs> so it's been time well spent. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. I thought I'd share a little something with you before we leave Abbey Pumping Station today. The end of 3D printing in the UK, and this is one of the early prototypes. Recognise him? Kevin Keegan. And who knows, in 100 years from now, people could be looking at this as an antique of the future. And they might well also be asking, what was a pun? From the Roadshow team, until next time, bye-bye.